a lot of um, orthopedic things were managed not optimally. So you saw people walking around with plaster casts, fiberglass casts, and things like that, because essentially what you do is set bone, put them back into place, and then treat them in a cast. And then um, you know, they would heal a lot perfectly, but good enough that people would function pretty well. You know, everything evolves, I know orthopedics has evolved. And truthfully, like I almost never put on a cast anymore. So a lot of things we treat are surgical. But the truth of the matter is orthopedics is a like I do sports medicine. So sports medicine is as close to general orthopedics as you can do because as a sports medicine specialist, like I take care of kids who hurt their necks, their backs, their wrists, their shoulders, their elbows, their knees, their ankles. Now, it doesn't mean that I, I definitively take care of everything, but I do a value on that. Orthopedics kind of has broken itself up into subspecialties again. In the beginning of my training, there wasn't as much subspecialization in orthopedics. In 2023, if you live in a metropolitan area, you're going to subspecialize in, in orthopedic surgery. So, you know, the, there's a, the people who are traumatologists, people like Dr. Sahabian, for instance, who all he does is fix broken bones. That's what he does basically five, four and a half to five days a week. He's in the operating room, you know, all those, every, almost every day. He has one day that he's in the office and sees his follow-ups. But as a traumatologist, he doesn't need, he doesn't know, he doesn't get to know his patients, right? He's on call, someone comes in, they, they're in a car accident, they break the femur, you go to the emergency room, I got a broken femur, Dr. Sabian's on call, he's gonna fix it. So. The patients, that's a kind of a difficult situation because the patients don't know you as a physician, so they don't really trust you. They don't know if you're good or bad or whatever. And you don't know them. Right? You don't know if they're a reliable patient. Are they have poor, you know, are they have poor health habits? Are they a bad diabetic? You know, maybe they're not a great candidate for surgery, but you have to make all these decisions on the fly. And he does all kinds of he does surgery in the upper arm, pelvis, he doesn't do spine surgery, um, you know, lower extremities. And so his is a very heavy operative subspecialty. Um, orthopedic surgeons also handle spine surgery. So I have partners like Dr. Chita Pettit and Dr. McDonald who are spine surgeons. That's all they do is spine. They take care of patients with back pain and neck pain, and that's it. So they're in the office, and then they operate a lot of times electively, but as spine surgeons in a location where we have a level one trauma center, they also take spine trauma calls. So spine is very specialized. If you do spine, generally you don't do anything else because it's such a super specialized subspecialty of orthopedic surgery. There's hand surgery. So hand surgeons like Dr. Monica or Dr. Letty, you can be a hand surgeon and operate from the wrist down to the fingertips, or you can be a hand and upper extremity specialist and operate from the shoulder all the way down to the hand. And that depends on what kind of practice you want to have. Now, hand surgeons, they also have their call because not only they have to take hand call, because like as a sports medicine surgeon, I honestly don't remember all the parts of the hand and like I can't promise. No one wants to be out on the other hand, trust me. <laughs> but they want Dr. Lay, Dr. Ma, because that's their expertise. So not only do they have to take general ortho call, but they also have to take hand call. So people put their hands in a wood chipper, um, they get their hands caught in a conveyor belt, you know, those are emergencies. You have to get up at two o'clock in the morning and go to the hospital and fix their bang land. That's that's part of the deal if you become an answer. Um, but there's a lot of life surgery, they have carpal tunnel problems, and then they have elbow problems and stuff like that. So that's a lot. So there's hand. Um, there's foot and ankle, and a lot of people think of, you know, you hear about podiatrists, and podiatrists do their, their style of foot and ankle surgery. But orthopedic surgery also has foot and ankle specialists, and they operate on you know basically below the knee, sort of the ankle all the way to the toes. You have um, sports medicine specialists, and again, like I said, sports medicine. If you find out with sports medicine, a lot of what we do in sports medicine are endoscopic surgery. So, as opposed to making big incisions and exposing everything, a lot of what I like, I, I basically do like ACL reconstructions. I do one or two or three a week. And it's all done arthroscopically. I do shoulder surgery arthroscopically. So I still do some open cases, but you have to like arthroscopy. And I can tell you, like training orthopedic residents, you know, an arthroscope is like a camera that's the size of a pencil, right? 
and you can put it into a joint, like into your shoulder, into your knee, into your head, and you can do work with other instruments that are also the size of a pencil. But if you're, you're not really physically seeing what you're doing. Your hands are here, you're looking up at the screen up there, and you're doing it that way. And some people have a, are pretty good at it, and you can tell you some lessons like, that. Nah, you shouldn't do anything with our class. It's just not in your skill set. That's okay. Um, but it's kind of fun if you, if you like. So I like that about sports medicine. Also, what I like about sports medicine is that it is kind of still general with the PD surgery. And then there's joint replacement surgery, which is one of the, one of the more popular subspecialties in orthopedics. Like somebody said, I do hip and knee replacement, because that's really what it comes down to. And you hear all about people getting total knees and total hips and partial knee replacements. And it's really like total joint surgery has put orthopedics on the map. Because a hip replacement is one of the most effective surgeries, surgeries in all of medicine. It's probably the best surgery in orthopedic surgery. Like if you have a grandmother who has an arthritic hip, she says, I'm getting a hip replacement, it's a home run. She's going to do great, she's going to love it, like 99% of the time. Um, when I was a resident, you know, hip replacements were done, patients would come in the night before, they'd get their surgery done the next morning, they'd stay in the hospital for 10 days. 2023, we do hip replacements in our surgery center. Come in the morning, get hip replacements, go for lunch. And that's the way, it is. so I, I've been in practice for 20, my son's 26, so I'm 26 years old now. Or 26 years in practice. So things have changed a lot. And, and you know, and it's very gratifying. And these are people who say, like, I can't walk a block. You know, I can't, you know, it's hard for me to go out, you know, shopping. Next thing you know, they get their replacement, they can walk as far as they want or their knee replacement. So again, the fact that it's become outpatient surgery makes it even a little bit more attractive. Because like as a sports medicine physician, I rarely go to the hospital, which is great for me, because I don't really want to go to the hospital. I do my work in an outpatient surgery center, which is actually on the third floor of my office. So I don't have to deal with emergencies, I don't have to deal with delays, because when you're in an outpatient surgery center, things are built for efficiency, and there's no, there's nothing unexpected. Like, you know, it's scheduled, this is what you're going to do. Surgeon say it takes me two hours to do this, it takes me one hour to do that, three hours to do this. So you know when you're going to be there, it's a great day. Like, I love being in my surgery center. And for most orthopedic surgeons, surgery is the fun part of what we do. I think everybody likes surgery. If you don't, I mean, if you don't like surgery, you shouldn't be an orthopedic surgeon, right? Because there's a lot of things you can do that are going to not happen. But to do surgery, you have to see patients. What people don't realize about orthopedics is that. For the majority of orthopedic surgeons, they probably spend more time in the office than they do in the OR. A typical orthopedic surgeon is in the office three days a week and in the OR two days a week. Now, you, if you're a very, very busy joint surgeon, it may be the other way around. You may be in the office two days a week and do total joints three days a week. But let's like, talk about my specialty sports medicine. I mean, if, you have, if you're an athlete and you have a Tennis elbow, right? Because you play, you know, because you play tennis, although I never see tennis players with tennis elbow, I see golfers with tennis elbow. I don't do surgery on tennis elbow, like nobody does surgery on tennis elbow. But you have to treat them, like you have to make the diagnosis, you have to then do their treatment, which is usually physical therapy, right? So my practice has physical therapy in our office, but we send a lot of patients to PT. We have I have runners who have stress fractures of the tibia or, or stress reactions of the tibia. So I have a high school athlete who's never run before and decides, I'm going to go off the cross country team this year. And all of a sudden, within seven days, they're running 40 or 50 miles a week. But well, their legs can't handle that and they get stress fractures. I'm not operating on those, but I'm walking them through and saying, well, you know, you should have been training all summer. You should have been ramping up your mileage gradually. So that, you know, in sports medicine, there's so much more of it is not operative than not. There's a lot of injuries that we treat, you know, not operative than like everything. So you dislocate your shoulder, right? So let's say a football player, who's, you know, the second game of the season dislocates his shoulder. The answer isn't to operate on him. The answer is to pop his shoulder back in, which is really easy. And then have him do rehab and get him back on the field in like four weeks, so he's playing again. Now, he may play again, and his shoulder may never come out again. He never gets an operation. But there's a high likelihood that his shoulder will be unstable at the end of the season. I'll do surgery to fix it. But it doesn't mean I'm doing it right away. And I'm hoping that I can never operate, not have to operate on the person. Because most people are kind of better off if they are having that surgery. So, you know, you have to understand that from, from an orthopedic standpoint, you know, don't think of it as just surgery. Um, I will tell you it's a very labor-intense lifestyle. 
you know, we're at Robert Wood Johnson, we are, um, it's a level one trauma center. So even, I, I take a trauma call like once every six nights. So like two weekends ago, or not, a few weekends ago, I was on call for the weekends, but I was on call Saturday and Sunday. And I sit home and I wait for my pager, my phone to go off. And the residents tell me today we have a hip fracture, a broken femur, a broken tibia. And that's how I spend my Saturday and Sunday fixing broken bones to that call. But also, I can be asleep at two in the morning and somebody get hit by a car and have an open tibia fracture with a compartment syndrome. Well, that's an orthopedic emergency. Like, I can get up, get out of bed, and have to operate on that patient probably for two hours. I have to go home, take a shower, and go back and see 35 patients. You know, be awake and alert. So, you know, if you're, if you're afraid of it, if you don't like getting up at night and working in the middle of the night, I wouldn't necessarily recommend orthopedic surgery as, as your subspecialty of choice. Now, if you can move on into your career, you can have built such a busy elective practice that maybe you can get off the call schedule, but it's not really that feasible in too many places. I have to drink every once in a while because my voice goes bad very quickly for some reason. But I think, you know, orthopedics, I always say, when I was a medical student, I, I kind of went to medical school wanting to be an orthopedic surgeon, so I'm biased from that standpoint. But I remember when I finally got through my boring first two years of medical school and got to the hospital, it always seemed like the orthopedic doctors were the happiest ones around me. They're always laughing and joking and going into each other's room and watching each other do surgery and stuff like that. And I do think, like, in general, it's a really fun specialty because your patients get better, right? Like, you know, if you treat somebody with diabetes, you never cure diabetes, right? You just treat diabetes. And a lot of, there are a lot of doctors who want that long-term relationship with their patients. But I do ACL surgery on a high school athlete, and they get better in six months, and they go back and play sports, I never want to see them again. Because I see them again because something wrong with the surgery that I did. Unless they hurt their other knee, then I'll have to come back. <laughs> which unfortunately happens more often than you think. But that's, that's a big difference about orthopedics. There's, there's almost nothing in orthopedics that you want to treat longitudinally. We want somebody to come in with a musculoskeletal complaint. We want to give them an injection. We want to send them physical therapy. We want to teach them home exercises. We want to do surgery on them. But we want to get them better and say goodbye. And that's it, you're done. That's all there is to it. So, um, and the other, I left out one specialty of orthopedic surgery is really important. And that's pediatric orthopedics. So there are orthopedic surgeons who only take care of kids. Now, there's a lot of the subspecialists that I talked about take care of kids as well. Like I do sports medicine and I do surgery on kids in eighth grade. And, I, and our hand surgeons do hand deformities and kids who are like, you know, little babies. But pediatric orthopedics, you got they do scoliosis surgery, they do cerebral palsy, they do spina bifida. So, you see a lot of kids with neurologic disorders. Um, so, but pediatric orthopedics, again, is a subspecialty into itself. Like if you do pediatric orthopedics, you don't operate on adults. Your office has kids coming in all the time, um, and, that's, and that's what you do. So I don't that one out. that's a really big one. So, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of what life of, the life of an orthopedic surgeon is. I think if you practice in a metropolitan area like we are here in Central New Jersey, you tend to be a subspecialist. But let's say you choose to practice in, you know, Central or Western Massachusetts, where there's really not a lot of people, there's not a lot of hospitals, you know, trip over a hospital every five miles, right? There's probably one hospital, another one's like 50 miles away. So one of my, one of my actually resident um, colleagues, he finished our program, did a sports analysis fellowship, and he had this why I said Western Massachusetts. He went out to Western Massachusetts, and for a period of time, he was the only orthopedic surgeon in the area, the only one. So he did everything. He did hip replacement, knee replacement, shoulder surgery, knee surgery. He, you know, luckily with the training, like when you leave training, you should be a good general orthopedic surgeon. And patient expectations in the rural areas are honestly a little bit different. They're like, thank God there's a doctor here because like, otherwise they have to drive all the way to Boston to find somebody that's a long way away. So they were glad that they had Dr. Rizzoni there to take care of him. He did a great job. But you know, that's, it, that's rare. Like not so many people who grow up in a metropolitan area choose to go practice in a rural area. So for most people in our residency program, Almost all the residents will finish their residency, which is five years long, 
and then they'll go to a subspecialty fellowship and whatever they find that they like, that's another year. And then you start your practice. So if you want to be an orthopedic surgeon, you start making money when you're about 30 years old. It's a long time. And that's hard on some people. Like as a resident program director, I've talked several of our residents off the shelf, off the you know, ledge, because they're like, all their friends, their lives are taken off. They're about like 25, 26 year old. They're making money, they're buying cars. You know. They're working, their residents are working 80 hours a week. You know, they don't get a lot of, you know, they don't get a lot of vacation. And they're not really going to go into practice for another five or six years. That's when their career starts. So you have to commit to that. Like, you know, there's no shortcuts. Like, you can't be like a superstar with Pete Wesson and graduate in two years. It takes five years. And you're probably going to have to do a fellowship. And so it's another six years. So, you know, that's, it's, um, but it's all worth it because it's just, it's a great specialty. I mean, I really do love what I do. Like, I, there's nothing else I would ever do. I was, when I was in medical school, I said, if I don't match for the I'm quitting. Like, I'm not going to be any other doctor. I wasn't anything else I would do. Lucky I got it. It's not that easy to get in, so. So I'll, I'll stop now just to ask any questions about it. That was a very kind of brief overview of orthopedic surgery. Um, any specific questions about the subspecialty? You saw our research. I did indeed. Uh, spinal lower fracture. That's why she doesn't want to catch you. Um, yeah, uh, I was curious about, um, you know, in a specialty like ID, right, you're, you're seeing a lot of very rapid change in the field because a lot of new drugs are being introduced to the market really quickly. Um, pathogens change pretty rapidly. Um, technologies change rapidly. Uh, and so you're really in a constant state of learning. Um, would you say that orthopedic surgery is similar? I feel like technology is Absolutely, yeah. yeah. There's, there's no specialty in medicine where technology isn't like advancing things for you. Again, if you think about you know, the, the years that I've been in practice, the way you place into my phone, a 10 day in a hospital stay to an outpatient surgery, that's, that's all technologically. Arthroscopic things that we used to have to do, like when I was a resident, a lot of the sports medicine surgery that they do on shoulders, there was no such thing as an arthroscopic, arthroscopic bank heart repair. Now, you know, 50% of the bank heart repair that you are arthroscopic. So it's always changing. And I know if any of you heard or listened to my lecture that I did when I was to that and once about anatomy, I mean, when I was a medical student, Nobody ever talked about an MPFL reconstruction, which is a medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction for people who were currently dislocated or patellolateral. I don't even think anyone cared that there was an MPFL, if you want to know the truth. And here we are in 2023, and the, treat, the surgical treatment of choice for patella instability is MPFL reconstruction. So there's an operation that didn't even exist when I was a resident. It's now the gold standard. So it never stops. I mean, that's, and I can say that like when I talk to people that aren't doctors, you know, like you have to continually keep up with what's going on in this. Like, you know, if, you're, if you pump gas for a living, you don't go home and we got a pump gas back. You just go to work, go home to experience and pump gas the next day. But if you're an orthopedic surgeon, if you're an ID doctor, if you're a family medicine doctor, you're reading medical journals, you're going to educational meetings, you never stop learning. And if you, if you decide you're gonna stop learning, you should quit because you're burned out and it's, it's time to stop. So, I mean, for us, you know, Robert with Johnson, like we're all in private practice, but we teach residents. So they kind of keep us on their toes. Like they, you know, they make us, it's not, you know, we're, we like what we do, but the resident, you know, if you're working in private, like I actually did work in private practice for two years in California before I moved back to New Jersey. And um, I realized what it was like being in a non academic setting. Like it would be very easy to fall into a rut and say, this is what would work for me, it works well, and I'm just going to keep on doing it until I retire. But when you come back to an academic setting, it doesn't sound. Anything else? All right, so now I want to talk about the match or getting into orthopedics because I think that that's actually was my big plan for today because I think it's important um, to hear about this as a first year medical student. So undergrads, if you're thinking you want to be a orthopedic resident someday, this could be just as scary for you. <laughs> Orthopedics is like extremely difficult to match. Like, 
I went to medical school, and I didn't, I, like, I didn't know any doctors in my family. I didn't know anything about medicine. I was actually a chemical engineer as an undergrad. So I just went to medical school and said, well, you know, go to medical school, you get studying, you choose your residency, and you do what you want to do. Well, I found out a little late in the game that orthopedics was very competitive. And not everybody who wants to be an orthopedic surgeon gets to be an orthopedic surgeon, just like not everyone who's an undergrad gets to go to medical school, right? So you have this, you know, life is a big parent. You start at high school, then you go to college, you go to medical school, you go to residency, you go to fellowship, and then you go to practice. So, you know, people get kind of weeded out as time goes on. But um, in orthopedics, like in the last few years, more than 40% of the people that applied to orthopedics didn't match. So that's a lot, it's so you're getting close to half. So that's a, kind of a drag if you think about it. You put all that effort in at medical school, and then you can't do the subspecialty that you want to do. So, and I don't think that's going to change. I can't really explain why over the last few years we've seen more applicants to orthopedic surgery. Um, it may be that, you know, the, the annual median income of orthopedic surgeons is pretty high compared to a lot of other subspecialties, but I hope that you're not in this for the money. Because if you're in it for the money, you're making a big mistake. Um, it's not, there's a lot of extra hours. Your hourly wage is as high as you think. Um, but it's just, I think people like it. They like a lot of the things I just talked about, the thing about getting people better. People like to work with their hands, right? People talk about what are we using our quick surgeries? Drills and hammers and saws. It's like doing carpentry on a human body, right? It really is, it's kind of cool. So um, maybe that's why people want to do it. I don't, I don't know, but it's, it's become increasingly competitive. So I think, you know, you have to make yourself a competitive candidate for residency. And that really starts from the very beginning of medical school. Because if you look at your medical school education, let's say you decide you want to go into family medicine, the second most common complaint that a patient has when they go see their family medicine doctor is a musculoskeletal complaint. The element of education that family medicine physicians feel the least educated in is musculoskeletal medicine. Like, you guys don't learn about muscular. Like, does anybody in, in, in your medical school, unless you do an ortho rotation, no one's ever going to teach you about tennis elbow. But you're going to go home, you could be an OB guy doctor, and you're going to be at a party, and your aunt is going to say, My elbow hurts. What do you think that is? And you say, Well, I don't know. I tell her to pick these. Like, leave me alone. But they think you know everything, right? I mean, my, my, my family asked me about like, kidney practice. So, like, I don't know. <laughs> Not asking questions, so you, go, you kind of go back to your medical school knowledge base, but you don't get musculoskeletal medicine. But if, so I think you have to say, like, well, I'm interested in orthopedics, and I know it's really competitive, so I'm going to do what I can do to learn as much as I can to make sure, number one, that this is what I want to do, and number two, give myself the best chance of getting in. So you got to do both things. It's not just making sure you get in. You have to make sure that this is what you want to do. So. What I've always encouraged the medical students to do is, um, number one, I'm just gonna start off with how our, our department works. On Monday mornings, we have orthopedic fracture conference at 7.30, and it's in the auditorium in the medical education building. We also have it on Zoom, which I'm a, I'm a big, I'm against Zoom lectures, but I'm getting old, and I guess I'm getting old fashioned. But I do think in-person lectures are better. That's why I'm here today rather than talking to um, when the way fracture conference works is that the residents take care of a lot of fractures through the week. Some of them they just like put a splint on and say go to the office. Some of them they operate on. So every Monday morning they present all the cases to the other residents and faculty. And the faculty ask them all kinds of questions. So, you know, why did you do this? Why did you do that? You know, they ask them like what are the criteria for treating this operably versus not operably. Now as a first year medical student, a lot of this goes over your head. So if I told you, you know, there's a, I have a commonly due distal radius fracture with 15 degrees of apex dorsal angulation and loss of inclination, you're like, what the hell is he talking about, right? All it is is a broken wrist. That's what it is. Now, what do you do with the broken wrist? Well, if you set it, if you put it back into place and put it in a splint, you can put it in a splint and say, well, that's a pretty good position. We're going to treat that in a cast. Or you can try to put it back in a position that won't go back. So then you have to say, well, what we're going to operate on, we're going to fix it with plates and screws. And during fracture conference, the residents explain why this was operated on, 
why it was treated closed and they had to know all the criteria. But as a medical student, no one's gonna ask you come, no one's gonna ask you any questions. Like, I promise you, you're not gonna ask any questions. So don't be afraid. But you're gonna learn orthopedic jargon. Like at some point you're gonna say, oh, I know what he means by dorsal angulation, or I know what he means by loss of inclination, because I mean they must treat like literally 15 wrist fractures a week. Like it gets boring. Like for me, I was like, oh, another wrist fracture, I can't take it anymore. But the hand guys they get all excited. <laughs> so I think going to fracture conferences is a good thing. And the residents are all there. Um, and after fracture conference, there's a little time to mill around. And you can actually get to meet some of the orthopedic residents. And I think that's a good idea. Because the orthopedic residents, they're the ones who just went through the process. Like I went through the process so long ago that probably without my experience as a medical school applying to medical student applying to orthopedics is borderline irrelevant to what what's going on in 2023. All these residents just did it like a few years ago. They can tell you what it's really like. So it's good to kind of make friends with the orthopedic residents. And by going to fracture conference on a regular basis, you know, you'll get to meet, you know, one or two of them. And I will tell you like one good thing about our residency program is that residents are very welcoming to medical students. So you know they like to talk to you, they like to talk about experiences, they want to help you. So you really should take advantage of that opportunity. On Thursday mornings, we have grand rounds. Grand rounds is when, I would tell you, 80% of the time it's a topic that's assigned to a resident and they give a presentation. It's usually a case based presentation. So they may talk about rotator cuff tears. And they'll say, they'll show like two or three cases of patients with rotator cuff tears. They'll show how it was treated. They'll give a lecture on rotator cuff tears. You know, these are the indications for not opera management, these are the indications for surgery. They start off with the basics of anatomy. Those medical students are, well, I get the anatomy part, that's good. But when people start talking about, well, you know, I did a, uh, a margin convergence on this supraspinatus area, then you're like, it's way over your head, but that's okay. Because when you're a third year student and you're doing a rotator cuff tear with, you know, Dr. Monica, you're like, oh, I remember my, I remember margin convergence from Graham Rounds when I was a first year student. Like, right, this, you're really gonna go, there's a lot of different topics. I'm saying like you're gonna again learn orthopedic lingo because no matter what specialty you do, there's like a lingo, there's a jargon that everybody talks. To. The earlier you learn that and it becomes part of your language, the better you're gonna be going forward. So I do think those two conferences, you know, that's again it's at 7:30 in the morning on Thursdays, it's in NED in the auditorium, and I, you know, just being there and watching is a good thing. And then after conference, you grab one of the residents, they all wear long white coats, and you say, excuse me, can I ask you a question? And you can ask them a question about what you saw. Like right? maybe you'll remember something from anatomy that, that is pertinent about the lecture they gave you or something. You know, just talk to them every once in a while. So those are two really good opportunities. Now, the orthopedic surgery interest group, uh, starting two years ago, I think it was Peter Phillips and a couple of other people, did an amazing job setting up opportunities for all of you to get to the office with some of the faculty once in a while and get to the OR with some of the faculty once in a while. And we have like a list, and you sign up for it, and this is your day. And you're usually seeing trauma or total joints or spine surgery because that's in hospital stuff. When you get later on in your medical school career, we get you into the surgery center and stuff like that. So that's another good opportunity. That's a great opportunity to just experience the subspecialty. Dr. Cott, Ryan Cott, Dr. McParland have done a great job with a, like a kind of, a, I think I forget what they call it, summer immersion program. But towards the end of first year, you get to you know go to the office a couple of days a week, go to the OR a couple of days a week. It's almost like a week of really intense orthopedic surgery. You get they have lectures at nighttime, they do a journal club with Dr. Buckley. It's a, it's got a tremendous feedback. And I think again, you're at the end of your first year and saying, after that week, if you didn't if you didn't like that week, then get out of orthopedics. It that means you don't like it that much, but it's a great experience. So those are the things that I think as your first year student, you gain some exposure. To what you do. What I used to tell you is that regardless of all that stuff, the most important thing is you do really well on part one of the board. So if you have your choice of studying and getting good grades or going to see an ACL reconstruction, study and get good grades. But you guys are all pass fail, so I mean if you don't pass then come on, right? <laughs> so your grades really don't matter that much, except it does apparently you guys can Ranked AOA based on what your grades are in the hidden back room, but, you know, so that's helpful. Um, and then I used to say what we used to do is 
we used to screen the, um, the, the boards for the applicants. So you, after your end of your second year, you took part in one of the boards. And truthfully, to get everyone to peace, you probably had to be in the upper you know, quartile of medical students to have a shot at getting into orthopedic surgery. And that really hasn't changed. But now part one of the boards is passed down. So why study for the boards? Like, I'm not kidding. Like, I don't know what the right answer is. But why would you study for part? You can't pass part one. Yeah, you gotta study, but you don't study that part. Because you don't need to get a 260. All you need to get is a P and not get an F, right? So don't waste your time. I mean, that's my opinion. <laughs> And I don't, I don't, I don't, but the problem is now you don't have part one to, to compare yourself to everybody else. So at the end of your third year, you take part two. And now your part two score is all you got. And if you don't do well on part two, well, there's not a part three. It's like people did poorly in part one, so crap. Like I'm going to study really hard in part two. And they went from like the 30th percentile to the 80th percentile. They save themselves. You can't save yourself in part. There's no, there's no, nothing after part two. So you better do well in part two, I'll tell you that. And I'm not big, I'm not actually, it's interesting because in our residency, we don't teach for tests. Like the, the residents take the work they can't train exam every year. And we have some residents who get the 97th percentile. We have residents who get the 30th percentile. As long as they're gonna pass their orthopedic boards, honestly, I don't care how they're doing the tests. Because I don't think being a good test taker makes you a good doctor. But to get into orthopedics, Boards were really, really critical. So I used to kind of, at this point in time, I'd say, that's what I would say in the first two years, you know, just study your brains out and, get, and take, you know, do really well on the boards. Because if you don't do that, you're, you have almost no chance. Like, there was a time, like, I will tell you, like, the board scores go, I've seen people get board scores, like, as high as 270 or something like that, which is really high. But we still, like, set a filter for the boards that are about 235. So if your board scores are under 235, we didn't download your application. And so our residency program has three spots. And I'm just going to back, go backwards two years. For the three spots that we match every year, we used to get 600 applications. There's no way our faculty are going through 600 applications. Like we don't have enough time. We're practices. So we would set the boards at a number and knock it down to 300. And then we would divide the 300 applications, and we would interview 50 people for interview. So I have 600 people who applied to Robert O. Johnson. Only 50 people got interviews for the three spots. Now there's a new, we'll talk about the network what's going on in that later on in the talk, but that's changing things a lot. So you still need to do well in medical school. I think getting AOA is an indication you're getting good grades, so that's kind of helpful. I think, unfortunately, the way things are transpiring, research is becoming a big part of orthopedics in terms of the orthopedic match. And you do have, at the end of your first year, this is your last summer off, by the way. Like after the end of your first year, there's no more summer vacation. Like you work all year round. But what you should be doing in your summer vacation is doing research. You can do research here at Robert Wood, you can go to Columbia, you can go to USC, you can go to UCLA, you can go wherever you want, but do some research if you think you want to go to more peace. Because as we lost the ability to use boards as a screen, and we're trying to say, well, how interested are these people on orthopedics? And everyone believes that doing research expresses your interest in orthopedics, which really isn't true, because the majority of people who go into orthopedic surgery are going to private practice, and they're really never going to do research again. Like, I'm a clinician scientist. I do basic science. I do clinical research, and I like it. And I'm not even like a hardcore research guy. But, you know, since the majority of people are going to private practice, why are we ramming research down their throats so we can separate them from one from the other? It's almost like a rite of passage, and it's almost unfair. But I'm sorry, that's the way it is. So you do your research the first, you know, in between your first and second year. But what it does is it introduces you to orthopedics. You learn the scientific method. You may meet some faculty members who will be your mentors, kind of go to bat for you when it comes time to apply for orthopedics. So I, you know, you have to spend your summer between first and second year doing research, and that's all there is to it. So you do that, you finish your second year, you take your boards and you get your P, and now you're into third year, right? Third year is when you get to do your clinical years, and that's, I think they actually give you grades when, as a third year now. Um, so I think you can get like a, a high pass, honors, uh, pass, low pass, and fail. Um, if you want to go into a case, you've got to get a high pass or an honors in surgery and medicine. I like the two big ones. Then there's psych and OBI and P's, you know, you got to at least get a pass, but you probably need to get 
You gotta get your grades because again, I'm telling you, what's the competitive that everyone's getting grades. So you need to do well in your clinical years. You probably should do surgery some a little early so you find out if you like the surgical lifestyle. Because you know, one of the things about surgery is like when you operate on somebody, they're your patient 24/7. Like it never changes. You know, if my if my patient has a complication after surgery, even though I take call every six nights, the rest is just call time. I, like right now, my patient can go off and say, the patient operated last week has pus pouring out of their knee. Then I want to shoot myself because now I feel, you know, I feel bad that I have a complication. Because complications take years off your life. I mean, it really, I, I hate, I hate, hate, hate complications. And every surgeon should and does hate complications. But when you're doing a lot of surgery on people, it's, you know, it's, it's really bad. But and you, again, you have to be prepared to do that. But, um, you know, that's, so you need to see that as part of the surgical lifestyle. The, as the school has allowed the third year students to do an orthopedic rotation, I would recommend doing that. We don't really pay a ton of attention to you as faculty members. Honestly, well, the residents do a lot of the teaching. It's really more for you to get the experience of orthopedics and learn what it's like and make sure you actually like it. So that's how, that's how you kind of get through the third year. And towards the, the latter end of the third year, you're going to start saying, well, I do want to do orthopedics. So now what's next is fourth year, right? And in fourth year, you're obviously going to do an orthopedic sub I. Like you're going to be like an orthopedic resident. And you're also going to do at least two, preferably three, away rotations. So you're going to kind of go to different institutions where you would think you would like to match. What would make you want to match somewhere? You might want to go somewhere because they have a super high-powered research program and you want to do academic medicine when you graduate. You might want to go somewhere in Southern California because you want to live in a sunny place. Or maybe your grandmother lives there and you can live there for free during the four week rotation because it's expensive. You got to fly there, you got to find a place to live. It's a place you don't know anything about. So doing a rotation somewhere you know, where you have some support is actually a really helpful thing. Um, you may have a fiance or a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you know you're getting married and you're, you decide we want to settle down in the Northeast. And you might as well do all your way electives in the Northeast because doing a rotation in California doesn't help you if that's not your goal. But if you have a wide open office, I don't know anywhere in the country, I should have to do the You're better off doing a way rotation somewhere else, showing that I'm not like tied to New Jersey. Because a bunch of you are probably like grew up in New Jersey, went to Rock Hill Center, and went to Battle School. Like, doesn't he ever want to leave New Jersey, right? So it's, um, you know, that is part of how you kind of plan your way electives. Now you can look at yourself also as at what time are, am I a competitive student? Because like everyone has heard about a hospital for special surgery, right? They say it's one of the best orthopedic departments in the country. So if you want to go there, you better be like a superstar student. Like middle of you know, you know, students are median, you know, they do they're not gonna get into HSS unless their father works there. So if should you do an away rotation at HSS if you're not a super superstar? Probably not. Because realistically, you can go spend more weeks there, and you can see all the stuff they do, and you can learn a lot, but they're not going to take you. And it's just the reality of the world. Like, I'm just trying to be, if I'm not blunt, if I kind of sugarcoat this, it's only it's not worth your time. So and there's all different kinds of students, but the problem that you all are facing now is that you don't know where you stand because you're scheduling your fourth year electives before you've taken part two of the boards. So you don't know if you got a 267 or a 227. The 267 person going where they want. The 227 person may not even get five interviews for orthopedic residency. So, you know, that's the way it is. So I don't know how to counsel people other than being real. Like you should be looking at comparing yourself to your peers in medical school for the first couple of years and say, am I, you know, is it likely that I'm gonna do really well on the boards? Am I, am I considered a superstar student? So, what has happened as a result is that now students are saying, well, what can I do to separate myself away apart from my classmates? I'm going to do a research year. So now medical school becomes five years. So you do your first and second year, you do your third year, and then you leave Robert Wood and you go to Columbia or you go to Thomas Jefferson, you go to UCLA, and you do an entire year of research there in the orthopedic department. Why are you doing that? To, generate a CV that has 10 papers and 15 abstracts and two book chapters, right? And now you kind of think you're separating yourself away from everybody else. So going back a few years ago, 
the students that I call the bubble students, the ones who took part one of the boards and got, you know, 230 or 235, like, well, I'm not really that, you know, competitive. I'm gonna do research here, and that kind of pushed them over the hump. But now we see that the kids who have been amazing scores are also doing research here. So I'm, I, it's just, it, it's mind-boggling, but I've seen it happen to the point where I'm telling you, probably at least 50%, if not more than medical students do a research here. So I'm sorry to tell you that, but depending on how the next few years pan out, a lot of you may be doing a, a fifth year of medical school, which will be a research year. And I don't recommend doing it here because we know you, number one. So you know we're already going to go back for you. But you need as many people as possible to go back for you. So you got to go somewhere else and make, find another mentor, another supporter who's going to push you through the, through the application process. All right. So that's kind of, that's the way things have been going. Now, what has changed things dramatically over the last, well, last year was our first year doing it, there's now something called signaling. So when you apply for orthopedic surgery as a medical student, you get to signal 30 programs. So, so let me go back one step. Prior to signaling, the typical student applies to between 50 and 75 orthopedic residency spots. And out of their 50 applications, they got 20 interviews if they were lucky. A lot of students got 10 or less. And if you don't get the, there's a saying like, if you don't have 10 interviews or nine interviews, your chances of action go way down and all this kind of stuff. So what was before the pandemic, you apply and you had to go on interviews. And you had to get in a plane, like if you apply to Chicago, you had to go to Chicago. Well, the problem is like the University of Chicago interviews the same day as the University of Tennessee. So then you have to say, well, where, where do I go? You can't go to both. You can't be in both places at one time. But now with the pandemic, we weren't allowed to do away, we weren't allowed to do in-person interviews. So all the interviews were done on Zoom. So now you could do, you could do University of Tennessee in the morning and the University of Chicago in the afternoon. So the students who were again, the superstar students, they were like hoarding the interviews. They had like a ton of interviews. And there were other people who were good candidates, but hard candidates than interviews. So now we do something called signaling. So as a medical student, you can say, these are the 30 programs I would like to go to the most. So now, like when we screen our applications, the first screen is, did you signal Dr. Farquhar with us? And if you did, then we're gonna take a look at your application. If you didn't signal us, us, we're not looking at your application, I don't care. Just throw it in the dark, because I, if you are not in your top 30, I don't want you, that's all there is to it. And a lot of programs, there's very few programs where we're interview somebody who has to signal their program. So what it does is, even though I tell you last year I told the students, don't apply more than 30 programs. Nobody's gonna interview you. They all apply 50 programs. They did it anyway, because you're so insecure. Like everybody's telling you, you're, you are. Like, I'm standing here telling you this is really hard. So what are you gonna do? Like, you're like, I'm an idiot. I'm applying to 50. I'm doing it, because this is my future. Right? And I would have done the same thing sitting in your seat. Like, I guarantee you, I would have done the same thing. So. But what you're going to find is don't argue with the data. After two or three years of signaling, you're going to see that you don't get interviews of places that you don't signal. So then people aren't going to have to apply to 75 places and get you know 30 interview offers. They're going to apply to 30 places and get you know 15 interview offers. And there's going to be more interviews to the group. So maybe getting interviews will become a little bit easier in the ensuing years. And we are making a move back to in-person um, there's no orthopedic surgeon who wants to choose their residence by a Zoom interview. I mean, it's ridiculous. You're sitting in your office, you make one of these fancy backgrounds, or you put your clones on the wall, or you put your guitar in the back corner, or your blue saxophone, or whatever. Something's kind of make you look cool. And then um, and you're on Zoom doing that. And so, so what's that? The back? That's the big saxophone. Let me see you play. Like, hey, that's, we've seen that on like, Zoom interviews. When you come in person, that, you, know, you see body line, you get to meet people. For real. Like, we have a resident, Matt Deal, who's one of our PGY3s now. I remember interviewing Matt and looking at his picture, like, look at this short little stocky guy. And that's this big, tall, strapping guy. It's like, I had no idea that's what he looked like, but that's, it shows like the misperception. But we all would like to see everybody. And I would think, as medical students, you guys should want to do in person interviews. Because, like, what we, what we made, like, when during the pandemic, we had a professional photographer, videographer come in 
when we just like Robert Wood Johnson, Dr. Swarth Beef video, like Jones Fire, Rick Brunswick, and interviews with faculty, interviews with residents. And so the video is like 15 minutes long or something. Like you see the things on our website. And like, that's it. That's what you learned about Robert Wood. Like if you live in Chicago, I right, watch the video. They look like pretty cool guys. I got a couple there. But you know, then you get there and we're a bunch of dorks, right? It's like, I, I can't believe this. But so you should want to go because it's five years of your life residency. You want to be somewhere where you feel like you fit in, where you, there's a lot of camaraderie, where there's a lot of research opportunities, where the faculty are nice, where the faculty are hard ass, whatever you're looking for. You want to, you're gonna learn that in person a lot better than you're gonna learn via Zoom So I think it goes both ways. And I'm a big, big, big advocate of in-person interviews. Now, I've been, you know, criticized as being old fashioned. I got, you know, one of the deans said, like, what is it that you want to be surgeons? You have to do in-person interviews. Like, everyone else does it that way. Why can't you? It's because you have to let these people operate on our patients for the next five years. So you don't have to live with them for five years. I do. And I want to get to know them and make sure that I can take them for five years. And I mean, we're lucky. Like, orthopedic candidates are great. You're all smart. You're all ambitious. You work hard. I mean, you know, there's very few, like, bad apples in the pile. But if it was that easy, you would just take the application from them downstairs and take the bottom three and just take those three. Be done, right? Go back to work and see patients, but we don't do that. We try to make, a, like, if you see the work when I see Robert Wood, it's very cohesive and it's very collegial. And I think the reason it's that way is because the way we work the, the selection process. So I can, you know, make it sound funny, but in the end, the residents are, like, the face of our practices. They, they're the first responders for our patients in the emergency room. And they have to do a good job to take care of those patients. Because it can have an impact on how we manage them after the fact. And if they're, the patients are happy being taken care of by our residents, they're usually happy being taken care of by us. If they had a bad experience in the hospital or a bad experience in the office, it affects the way they perceive us as faculty or as their doctor. And they want to go somewhere else. I'm not going to Robert Wood. First doctor I met was like, you know, it's mean to me or hurt me or whatever. And that's the other So then they go somewhere else. And that's not bad for business. You know, we have a great, and I, I, most residencies are that way. You know, when you look at residencies, you can look like we're three residents per year. It's a five-year residency, so we have 15 people. You know, you, you can't hide when there's 15 residents. Like, there's a lot of work to do, and if you're lazy, you're going to stand out. You can't, like, do your own thing. you got to be part of the team. You go to NYU where they have something like 12 residents a year. So that's 12 times 5 is 60. You can hide there. Like you, can, you can kind of do your own thing, you know, kind of kiss up to the faculty and all that kind of stuff, and you're going to be a team player, and that's okay, too. Now, NYU has a great reputation, right? And some people like that. Like, some people don't want to be part of the team. They don't want to hang out with the group all the time. They just want to, like, do their work, study, get smart, learn to do a research, and go home and do whatever they do when they go home. Like, here, it's a little different. So, yeah, that's another one of the big things like in-person interviews. Like, you want to see the person on the program, it doesn't match you. And there's not one, there's not one best orthopedic residency because, you know, people who come, there's residencies who have, there's very strong clinic. Like we always say at Rutgers, the residents get to operate early and often. So as PGY2s, you're first assisting in surgery, and by the time you're done with the rotation, you're actually doing some of the operations, skin to skin. There's other residencies where it's a PGY2, you barely touch the scalpel. And you just, you just watch. And you don't start really operating through a PGY3. Some people like that. Some people are like, I need to be taught. I want my hand held and all this kind of stuff. And other places are like, just go get the work done and do it right. You learn, you know, kind of learn by trial by fire. And people, people thrive in different environments. So that's why you can't say, like, this is the best residency in the country. Because it's the best residency in the country for the five or the seven or the ten people that are there. But there's another place that's the best residency for, the, for two people. There's residencies that have two residents per year. And they love it there. And we had, we had, you know, Casey Amargano was a, like an outstanding medical school student at this school, went to Union Memorial down in Baltimore. I mean, it's like two residents per year. He loves it there. It's not, it's, it's not some high power residency. He's learning everything. And I'm sure he's doing a great job. He's a great medical student. We would have liked to have him here. But that's where he chose to go. And it's probably the right place for him. So don't, you know, don't get so bent up on, like, oh, I got to go get You got to go to the place where you're going to learn to be a really good work piece surgeon. Have a fun time doing it, and then go out and, and you know have a great career after that. So those are the things that you know. Those are the things that you go through the years. You start thinking about what am I looking for in life? You know, do I want to be an academic? Do I want to be in private practice? 
But I want to take care of sports. Now, so all those things come into play as you go through the process. But, um, you know, you do your, so you've done your aware rotations, all your interviews, and then, you know, you're, you're collecting letters of recommendation. So the way it works now is we have, uh, we'll have universal offer day on November 13th. So we're going to start on October, probably 10th or something. We'll download all the applications. We'll, we'll start the screen by who, um, who signaled us. If there's less than 300 applications, we'll just look at them all. If there's more than 300, we'll set a screen on the part two boards. And that'll be that. Um, one thing that's happened is DOs are now competitive for MD residencies because allopathic and osteopathic residents will sit for the same board of orthopedic surgery exam. These be two separate boards. You're like, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to take a DO exam. It doesn't matter anymore. They all take the same one. So last year, for the first time ever, we interviewed five um, DO candidates for our residency because they had great board scores, they were smart, they had great letters of recommendation. But in the past, you know, they would have to, they would have to sit for another board. So now they just take our board. So it doesn't matter anymore. So actually, that's another reason why there's more and more people applying to work. So you you signal, you take your interviews, you get letter, and while you're on these away rotations and all these things, and while you're doing research here and while you're doing things, you meet faculty member that you get to know and you feel like, oh, you know, I think Dr. Gavin likes me. I'm going to ask him to let me or write any letter of recommendation. If you think I don't like it, I not like everybody, but if you think I don't like it, don't ask me for a letter of recommendation because I'm not going to write you a letter. And it's hard because you think about it. Like, you're going to, there's some faculty members that get to know it pretty well. Let's say you say, well, I'm going to go do an away rotation at NYU because I would love to live in the city. And um, I hear that's a great program. So you go there and you do a four week rotation. In four weeks, you have to make a relationship with a faculty member and ask him to write or her to write your letter. So is that easy? No, it's not. Not easy at all. So you have to kind of feel yourself out. We do a lot of coaching on that when you get into your fourth year. Like we, we assign faculty mentors to every student applying for orthopedics. We meet with you before you start your away rotations. We coach you on how to succeed in those rotations. And like I said, the best thing you do is catch another residence because they just went through the system. And what you really want to get to do is you want to get to know the junior residents. Like, don't make friends with the chief residents because you're M1s. When you get to get M3s and M4s, they're gone. They're, they're out of here. Like, they won't be there to talk to them. Like, who's our PGY2s now? Like, um, like Jared Sane, right? He's going he's to be a chief when you guys are four. So you might as well get to know Jack because he's going to be a boss. But he's going to help you a lot more. But, so I always say, like, get to, learn, get to meet the twos and threes because the fours and the fives will be gone when you guys are at four. So that's what you want to get to know. Um, and they will help you a lot. So I, I don't know what's going to I think it used to be, this talk used to be very easy before signaling and before they changed part one of the boards to pass it down. Um, it wasn't a pleasant talk to give because you all left here feeling kind of bad. But um, I think things are better, but they're still not easy. And I don't know how to make them easy. There's, I, there's no way to make them easy. If you're not up to the challenge, then you should probably get out, unfortunately. It's just not easy. So it's a commitment. You know, it's like, like I said, I was a chemical engineer, and the engineering students were like, were like you, know, you had to struggle with A to B. And then some of the liberal arts students were like not doing anything right their last their paper two nights before the end of the semester and getting the A's and that this is not fair, but it's just life. That's what it is. If you don't want to show up, you want to go and mess. You know? And then you can match it where you want to go. Right? And I'm not, I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. I'm just saying that, you know, there's a gazillion family medicine residency spots. They don't even fill all the spots around the country. But in orthopedics, we have, we have to pick them to bring them the crop because 40% of you don't know, even get an RP exam. So it is what it is. It's just that's the way it is. And I, I'm not, I hope I don't sound cocky because I'm not. I tell the rest that, you know, this is, you know, it's a privilege to be an RP resident. You, you, if you match an RP, you better consider yourself lucky. You know, you get lucky because you worked hard and you earned it. But you have, you know, you have to, there's a lot of people. That I've seen go through the system, well, I thought were great candidates and never match. And they had to choose another specialty or something. So um, yeah, I just commit from day one. The, the hardest students that have counseling are the ones who come up to me as, 
and then three, and they did their surgery rotation to two weeks ortho. Man, ortho is really cool. I think I want to do that. And they've done nothing until that day. And I was like, well, what are we going to do now? Did you do any research? No, you know, we don't know their board support. So I say, well, you know, roll the dice and see what happens. But I'm telling you, it's all good that you're here as I want, because you've got to start from day one. That's why we give this lecture so early. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to ask, answer questions. Don't sign. <laughs> <laughs> because the NRP is really like the happiest person. It's so great. Yeah? Um, what would you recommend someone searching for a research position where they can make like a real body contribution or whatever project that is? So, you know, it depends. Like, if you do summer research, it's hard. It's, what you have to kind of accept the fact is that you're going to get involved in a project, and in August or September, when you go back to class, it's not over. Because how much research gets done in two months? Nothing, really. If you're really lucky and you find a project that's kind of in its tail end, and it's a short, nice, nice, neatly packaged project, theoretically, you could wrap something up by the end of the summer. But the truth of the matter is you have to continue through. So um, you have to look for projects that are, you know, look like they have good leadership, um, look like they have good planning and good direction. And that's probably the, the best advice. Um, if you had to choose between, um, say, uh, a year of research and a really excellent letter from an ortho faculty when you're looking at a residence application, or a resident application, which one is more important to you? Really excellent letter. But they're, they can be hard to come by. Because I think like this year, I don't know how many students are applying for it. It's a lot, because I, I've just finished writing all my letters, and my eyes are clear to me, and that's the like 12, or something like that. There's the best student in the class, and there's the not best student. It doesn't mean they're not best student isn't good, they're just not as good as the best, right? Like, that's life, right? People are better than that. They're... And so there may be people, somebody might call me and say, well, I have, you know, student A and student B coming out of your school. Who would you pick? I got to give them an answer. And the, the kind of the BS answer, oh, they're both really good, you know? And I said, I, I know they're both really good, but who would you pick? And I do the same, you know, I could do the same thing if I was really, like, looking at carefully candidates. But, you know, so that's kind of what happens like, when we write our letters. And we kind of, there's internal ranking systems, too. Of, like, you know, this is, I would say that this person's going to be in the top one-third of our rank list, and this person's going to be in the middle one-third of our rank list. And, you know, we try to be semi-vague, but we also try to be fair to each other. Because you know? the last thing you want to do is send somebody a death. I mean, there are students, I mean, I, you know, the faculty, including myself, not just me will tell some students, you know what, this is just not the right special you. I know this is what you want to do, but don't do it because you're not going to be happy. So those are few and far between, but they do exist. So I'm not going to take some kid who's like, I know he doesn't have a future orthopedic surgeon and write a great letter, so he's going to be a great orthopedic president, because he's not, or she's not. So you to be honest. But the great letters, but the great letters are great. And I'm like, and I need a great letter. Like, I wrote a letter for one of our residents sometime, and I said, who was applying for fellowship. The fellowship is competitive too, right? And I said, if this person wanted to practice in New Jersey, I would want them in my practice at my mark. And what more can I say? Like, I want them working with them for the rest of their careers. I mean, that, that seals the deal right there. But how many people write that that often? That's not their own. Like, oh, this is such a hard worker, great work ethic, you know, he tells good jokes, and he should be blessed to work with for five years, you'll love to teach them. And this was like all the things, but every now and then you get a letter that's just like, you, you know that this person just gets it. We always like, I even put that on that, but this person gets it, you know, gets the big picture. But you, know, you don't know if you're going to get a letter from somebody. I always tell you, but if, even if you run, Pediatrics and a doctor from pediatrics says, when you apply for residency, I don't care what you apply for, I want to write you a letter, you take that letter. Because we, I mean, we all write a lot of letters, and we write letters for students that we really like, and we write students for letters for students we like, and ones that we're like, you know, we'll write the letter. 
But if a faculty goes out of their way to want to write a letter their way, they would like a great letter. So date, that'll be a good one. Probably your best letter. Um, follow-up question. Okay. What qualities in your mind make a medical student particularly um, particularly valuable as a potential uh, ortho resident? Um, let me just check one thing. <laughs> uh, so I, I think, you know, again, it goes down to your, the program that you have, but I think, you know, it's a, kind of a cliche, it sounds cliche, but somebody who's a team player, um, somebody who is going to, you know, commit to excellence. You know, here's again another story, like I had a resident, like, years ago, and he was a very mediocre resident, and we would have my annual meeting, like, semi-annual evaluation meeting. I say, yeah, you're, you know, you're doing okay. You know, your board score, your training scores be higher. Your surgical skills be a little better. You know, you're fine. But yeah, you know, was, you know, my life's been really tough the last year, but I am really going to commit next year. I'm going to be a much better resident. I said, really? You really are going to be a better resident? I said, you're married. You have two kids. You're starting a side business with your wife. You're not. I said, but it's okay. Like you don't have to be the best resident ever to graduate from our program. Like you're just, you're. That's where you are. That's your. Your choice is in line. But when you're picking your medical student, you want to, a guy like this look for students who they're going to give back to the program. Like It's a give and take relationship teaching. Like I like teaching people who want to learn. So become well prepared for cases. If you've read papers, if you watch you know, five videos on how to do the surgery, um, and you want to talk about it, then it gets to be more interactive. If I'm like spoon feeding or anything, like I'm bored, I'd rather talk about the Mets and how disappointing their year was because I don't have to think. But it makes teaching fun. So you want, you want that student who's going to say, I have five years to learn as much about one piece surgery as I can. And during those five years, it's going to be the most important thing in my life. You know, you're going to sacrifice for this. And the residency program is going to be a better place because you were there for five years. And that's kind of what I look for, you know. If it's somebody that thinks, you know, they're, like they've had such a great academic career as a medical student, and, you know, they, they deserve to get an orthopedics. I probably don't love them. Because I'm telling you, I don't care how good your record is, there are people with outstanding records who've never met. So don't, you're, I, you're not that good. Unless your dad's the chairman of a program or your mom's the chairman of a program, you have no guarantees of getting in. So that's what I look for. You know. it's, it's, it's a lot of work. I mean, residency is, again, like I said, it's a time of life when your friends who went into business and marketing, they're taking off. You're not even getting started. At what point in your career during residency do you typically decide what you want to specialize in? Um, everybody's different. So I went to medical school, wanted to be a sports medicine or a surgeon. And that's what I am right now. So that's kind of weird, but it's true. But I would tell you that most people have an idea what they might want to do. But then they get into residency and they see it in action. So the problem is you don't get to see everything right away. So as a PGY1, you're an intern and you're like working in the emergency room and not really seeing the subspecialties in full bloom. Then you become a PGY2 and you do PT ortho, you do hand, and you do um, knees, hand, and spine. Then you become a PGY3 and you do sports, trauma, and joints. So by that time, you've seen all the subspecialties of orthopedics. So towards the tail end of your PGY two, three year, you've seen everything and you better make a decision. Because around your, in the end of your PGY four year, you start applying for fellowship and this whole painful process starts all over again. It's fellowship way better. Like it's, it's nowhere near as daunting as the, as the residency process, but it's still competitive. So I would say by the end of your PGY three year, you should have a pretty good idea. Like one guy that came in and he's like, I want to be a spine surgeon. Like, right from day one, I want to be a spine surgeon. So does spine, does a spine rotation and sees like two absolutely devastating complications. It's like, there is no way I'm doing spine. I can live, my, live with myself if that happened to my patients any way. He went into uh, joints. So you don't really know, like you have this, 
preconceived notion of what it's like. And trust me, what you see and witness as a medical student, like if you do research in hand, you're gonna, you're gonna go into residency and say, oh, I wanna be a hand surgeon. But then you're gonna be like, oh, I sit down all day and operate these little tiny little hands. The joints you gotta get these hammers and all. That's way more fun than you do joints. That's just because the only thing you saw was hand. So it looks cool. But then you do it as a resident, because I guess not as cool as the book. Because other stuff is more fun. For you. But everybody's different, right? That's the most important thing. Everybody's different. Every program's different. Every person is different. That's, that's the, kind of the beauties of medicine. I say, like, we're, we're, you guys are being like, educated, talking about AI and all this kind of stuff. You know, like, medicine is a science, but talk about the art of medicine. The art of medicine is what's so beautiful about it. You know, you can have two people with the same exact x rays and the same exact diagnosis, and you'll tell this one person, you should have surgery, and you're going to do great, and you tell the other person, you're going to go to physical therapy because you know they're going to do crappy after surgery. But if you can't make that call as an orthopedic surgeon, you're going to have a lot of unhappy patients. Like, there's a lot of things. Like, if I have a woman or a man who weighs 300 pounds and tears his ACL, and this big exercise is getting from the couch to the refrigerator to grab a beer, like, he doesn't need his ACL, right? If I do his ACL, he's probably going to do, probably gonna get stiff, and he's not going to go out play sports anyway. And if he gets a complication, I feel bad. But if I take care of a college athlete, the right answer is to do an ACL. That's the art of medicine. Same diagnosis, same x ray, same MRI. But totally different patients. So that's why, you know, those things, what you see when you witness early on is not what you learn later with your experience. You have a question? Yeah, so you said that you did uh, a little bit of time in California. So how did you think that the program, like, so you said programs are different. How did you feel that the style of. Well, I've been practicing in California. Okay. But I think, you know, nationwide, is again, like, here in the New York metropolitan area, you have a lot of people that are super specialized. Let's just say you decided I'm going to do my residency at the University of Nebraska, right? Well, Nebraska, like the University of Nebraska is the only academic center in the whole state, right? So people actually come from all over Nebraska to have surgery and stuff like that. You see a much different kind of like patient population. I mean, you know, is the, is the patient population in um, Nebraska really diverse? Is as diverse as what you see here in the are probably not. I mean, there's a lot of farmers out there, I mean, and again, just that's what life is like out there, unless you're from, you know, somebody knows something about Nebraska that I don't know, but, like, I go out there with the Rutgers football team, and, like, you fly over cornfields, and you see these big farms, and, and that's, and you listen to the University of Nebraska Residence Center for Research, they talk about tractor injuries, like, I don't, I don't see tractor injuries in the front, but I see gunshots, and I see motor vehicle accidents, from 287, right? So it's, it's different. So that's what the real difference is. But I think, again, you know, in orthopedics, it's because it's musculoskeletal medicine, and all, it all applies. Like people get hurt jumping off their tractor, and people get hurt falling off the rock climbing wall, right? It's, just, it's the same injury, it's just they got hurt in a different way. So you can treat them from a sports or a trauma standpoint. But it depends on the environment that you want to live in, right? I mean, I can tell you, I don't know if you've been to Lincoln, Nebraska, but there's not a lot to do there. <laughs> There's a lot more to do here in the brother than there is in life. That may be the kind of lifestyle you like. So that's probably more of it is about the environment outside the hospital. I mean, orthopedics is orthopedics. You know, some programs have like, take Newark compared to New Brunswick, for instance. Newark has an oncology service. And orthopedic oncology is a very, very, very fine subset of orthopedic surgery. We don't do orthopedic oncology here. We refer it to Newark or Memorial Sloan Kettering or Philadelphia. But if you do your residency in Newark, you see you're on an ortho-oncology service. But how many residents go into orthopedic oncology? Like in my entire time as a residency program director, we had one resident um, go into oncology. And I've been here for a long time. So it's not very common. So if you're thinking, well, I, I think I would like to do ortho-oncology, you might want to go to a program where you get to do ortho-oncology. But that, that's like, other than that, there's not much difference. You know, some places don't have a very strong PF orthopedic department. We have a strong one, so you get to, we our residency PF or PH through their entire residency. Some residencies just farm their residents out to a PF hospital for six months, and that's the only PF orthopedic store that they get. So if you think you might like taking care of kids, you might want to go somewhere with more PF. But again, that's the kind of coaching that we do when you pass second year 
you're in the third year, we start measuring about where you want to do your way on this. I think a lot of it has to do with the environment outside of Austin. How do you want to live your life when you have some free time? Which you don't have that much of, but. So, going back to your previous answer about talking about like different niches of orthopedic and how like, everyone's different. Even as an undergrad student who wants to go to orthopedics, do um, you think shadowing someone? help them find their space? I think it, I don't think it will help you find your space as much as now you make sure that maybe orthopedics is something you'd be interested in. So I do think it's a reasonable thing to do. Again, we have opportunities for undergrads to work with the residents a little bit and things like that. I will tell you, like as undergrads, if you want to shadow orthopedics, any doctor, but especially as the fall is a terrible time to shadow because that's when we're looking at all the fourth year medical students. The springtime, kind of like the recruiting process is dead. And that's a good time to kind of latch on to it or be another doctor and do some shadowing. And usually shadowing for a week is a reasonable amount of time. Like I'll, I'll do some shadowing with students. I'll say spend a day with me in the office, a day with me in the OR, spend a couple of days with the residents, and make sure you see like a more of a broad swing. Because like spending time with me in my practice doesn't show you what it's like to be a resident. And being a resident is like, you gotta make you do that first. You might want to see what being a resident is like. And some people look at the resident like, I don't want to be worth I don't want to take all every third night. And I don't want to be in up all night. Like, I mean, our residents, when they take all of Arnold Johnson, they barely sleep. You know, it's, if you do dermatology, residency, you get to sleep. <laughs> There's not a lot of your health. No one calls you two in the morning for a dermatology emergency. So you get to sleep. And that's important to me. Now, don't laugh. But I think that's important to people. It really is. Like, I, 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 one of my best friends in medical school, you know, and I'm, I try not to be, you know, talk about like, it's, everyone, when I was in medical school, it was like, oh, all the dumb jocks go to work piece, which was stupid because it wasn't really true. But this guy looked like the programs of work piece. I said, like, how, it, he, he had no, he said, I hate work piece. Like, who would ever want to do that? It's, he became a pediatrician, you know, and like, again, they said, like, I don't want to, I don't want to do surgery. And I want to, like, get to know my patients and all this kind of stuff, so. Doesn't, you know, all that's what I'm saying, everybody's different. But I think shouting is a great idea. I think shouting, but I would recommend shouting some residents. Um, I have an additional comment to make on that, uh, just from like an undergrad to medical student perspective. Like, orthopedics or not, if you're not doing a significant amount of shadowing or clinical work, you're not going to get to med school to begin with. So. Is that what it is? That's the way it is now? Yeah. Wow. That's good. I didn't know that when I was Everything's more competitive. It's kind of crazy. Anything else? So I think what will happen is, you know, for the, the M1 students, we'll see how the match plays out this year. Because this will be our second year with signaling. So we'll we have more data back. We'll learn more about it. We'll get, you know, better advice next year than we are, are giving the current students this year, because this is our first year. And a year after that, we'll be able to give you better advice because we'll have three years of data to know where we stand. And we'll kind of learn how the system is going to play out, because everything's in evolution right now. And it's, I don't think it's going to kind of settle, settle down for another maybe three years that we really know that things reach a steady state. And the thing we're all like kind of worried about is that they're going to make part two of the board's pass down. Like, you should worry about it, that's what we're worried about. Because now we have, we've lost another screening tool. But that's, what they, but that's what they want. They don't want us to have screening tools. They want us to do holistic evaluations of the applications, which is, that's honorable. <laughs> but now I, I already did two surgeries today, and I have 35 patients to see tomorrow. And I don't feel like staying up till then, like looking at 500 applications. I cannot. I'm just being honest. And nobody is nobody else. Like, come on, really. Think you put yourself like fast forward and say, why well, wanna instead of hanging out with my wife and kids, I want to be three hundred thousand kids. I want to hang out with my wife and kids or your husband and kids. But it may go that way, so I don't know. But you know, that's why if it doesn't go that way three years from now, we'll have a new steady state and we'll be able to give you guys great advice that works well. So like for you as M1s, we'll be like, we it'll be right in our wheelhouse, we'll know exactly what to tell you. Right now we're trying to figure it out. Undergrads, 
think that's good advice. You know, man, I, I, I went to Lafayette. I started off my career like I would have a Lafayette student shadow me for a week. You know, I usually would have like three or four of them sign up over the summer. And this one student, um, and, I, and I've always worked really hard just in my, like I, I do my practice, I do sports coverage, I do research, I teach, all that kind of stuff. So this student from Lafayette comes and says, um, yeah, I definitely want to go to medical school. And after the week, um, she said, oh, there's no way I want to do this. Like, that's ridiculous. Like, I want to get married. And I was like, I don't want to work this hard. First thing is, well, look, like, not everybody works this hard, so don't let that scare you. So fast forward a few years later, I meet her, and she had become, instead of going to medical school, she became a physician assistant. And she was much, much happier. She said, like, you know, she was older and she was more mature. She wasn't married yet, actually. She, I don't know if she ever got married, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> she said, that I just didn't want that the ultimate responsibility. Like, I like taking care of patients. I like the interaction. She was a surgical PA. She's like, I like assisting in surgery. But when I go home at night, like, I get to go home and, like, put my head on my pillow, and I get to rest. You know, like, when you're, when you're a surgeon, like, you know, you do a lot of surgery, and you do A-plus surgeries, and you do A-surgeries, and you do B-surgeries, and B-plus surgeries. You know, when you get down into the B plus range, you start, you wake up at three in the morning, like, oh, I wish I had done a little bit better. Like, if your brain doesn't turn off, and I'm, you know, I'm like 60 years old now, and I still wake up at three in the morning thinking about the surgery I did last week, it, it never ends. When I stop getting, when I stop feeling bad about it, or stop wishing I could have done a better job, I'll probably, that's what I'll quit. So, it is a commitment that, you know, takes over, can, especially a surgical specialty, can take over your life. And it's gotten harder because, like, I carry this cell phone, which I, I, this, I can't tell you how many pages I got while I was talking to all of you, and I don't know how many are medically related. But when I first started, all there was was a pager. So I had a whole bunch of partners. I was, yeah, I was on call like every six night. The other five nights, nobody really could get a hold of me. The only person to get a hold of me was my partner who was on call, because he had my house phone, because I actually, you know, a lot of us didn't even care about cell phones. Now, it doesn't matter, I have a cell phone. So, the trainers from Rutgers, the trainers from Ryder, the residents of Rutgers, they think I'm available 24 seven. I was on vacation in Italy, and I heard three MRIs while I was in. <laughs> when I was first started, MRIs came on a big sheet of uh, film. So, I couldn't read the MRI in Italy, it was in the United States. Now it's I can look at it on my phone. So everybody wants the answer in one hour. And that's the way it is. Again, you have to commit to it. You say, I want to live that life. You know, you could be at your son's top water football game, or, and you have to like walk off into a shady area so you can look at it on your phone. And that's what I do. And I don't mind it. I'm not complaining. I'm saying make sure you know what you're taking yourself in. So as undergrads, you know, there's a lot, there's a, you know, some people are willing to do that. That's part of life. And other people say, I don't want to, I don't want to make that commitment. It's okay. Become a PA or become a dermatologist, you know. <laughs> and again, I'm going to become a dermatology. <laughs> dermatology is a great job, man. You know, make a ton of money, don't work that hard. <laughs> people love you because they look better after you see them. You get rid of rashes and stuff. It's wet, dry, it's dry, wet. That's all I know about with dermatology. <laughs> But, you know, or the like to make a lot of other specialties. Now. We still get, we all still get teased in all the other specialties. You know, because they're like, oh, you guys are glorified carpenters. Yeah, that's fine. Probably most of those aren't. All right. All right. All good? Everybody walk out of here smiling. Thank you so much. Because again, orthopedics is the best guy in the world. Um, medical students, before you guys leave, we have um, an attendance sheet for you guys to fill out. Um, Dr. Gatlin, thank you so much for that. Sure. Very sober. <laughs> <laughs>